Hi everyone, Professor Sackett Taylor here with another video lecture for Principles of Macroeconomics. This time we're looking at chapter nine, savings, interest rates, and the market for loanable funds. I hope that you've taken the time to brush up on your supply and demand model, because you're gonna find that we use it a lot in this chapter. So previously to this content, we just covered CPI, that is the consumer price index. We saw that this was the foundation for how we calculate inflation. Although the computation of the consumer price index can be difficult because the basket, if you will, of consumer goods tends to change over time. But the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, is always trying to adjust for this by adding in new algorithms and new formulas. Inflation tends to be widely misunderstood by the public. Um, and the most important piece to understand about inflation is the cost associated with it to the macroeconomic economy. Inflation is caused and controlled by expansion in the nation's money supply, which is a topic that we'll get into in a little bit more depth in a couple of chapters. Here, we wanna look at the market for loanable funds. And so in the market for loanable funds, we're interested in how the supply of loanable funds and the demand for loanable funds will meet in equilibrium and determine the price of money, which is the interest rate. We're gonna look at what would be a shifter to the supply of loanable funds and what would be a shifter to the demand for loanable funds, similar to what we did in chapter three, where we were looking at the market for goods and services. Okay, so the loanable funds market is the market where people who save money are supplying money to the people who demand it, who are seeking to borrow a loan. So here, instead of goods and services, the market is essentially the market for money, where we're looking at people supplying money to the market and people demanding money from the market. We could call this the market for savings or even just the market for loans, but we use the term loanable funds to really capture the implications of both of these things, that we people who are doing the saving are making money or loans available to those who are demanding it, the borrowers. So what we see is that the supply of funds comes from households and foreign entities who choose to open savings accounts in the United States. Foreign entities can include private citizens or governments that decide to save their money here because of the interest rates we offer. From that savings, they go into banks, bonds, or stocks, and this is what makes that money available to the borrowers in the market. The borrowers are the demanders, like the demand side, the consumption side, for loanable funds. They include businesses, firms, and governments. Firms demand borrowed funds in order to finance large expenses, such as big capital purchases or business expansion. The places that we physically think of as being the place where the market for loanable funds exists are the stock exchange, investment banks, mutual fund firms, or commercial banks. So this is a really important market to understand because firms are always in the position where they may need to borrow some money. Firms borrow money in order to make investment in future capital pur purchases. Most businesses can't fund large expenses like capital with cash alone. So without the loanable funds market, a lot of investment wouldn't be possible. And then therefore it would create a lag in production and GDP might stall or even fall. So the purpose of this market is to borrow money in order to prepare to produce more in the future. So they might invest in factories or other forms of business expansion, invest in expanding their workforce or invest in new capital such as machines and technology. Over time, this allows them produ to produce more than they were previously. And by selling that output, they can use the revenue to pay for that new capital and also pay back the loans that they took out to borrow um, the money they needed to invest in that capital. 
So where do firms get this money from? Well, every dollar borrowed requires that someone saved it first. Lenders obviously can't lend money they don't have. And so it's the savings accounts, both short-term and long-term, that provide funds for lenders to lend. Investment in requires borrowing. Firms usually do not have the cash flow for large investment. So in order for firms to borrow, the rest of us have to save. Without savings, future production is not sustainable. And the ability to tap into that savings is really important. The firm will want to borrow to buy resources to produce goods. So someone saves it, so someone can borrow it, so that person can then invest it and it can grow our domestic product or the amount, the value of the amount of goods and services that are produced in a given year in a given country. So people first have to save. Many people, especially those thinking about retirement or buying a house or a car or some other big purchase, worry about interest rates and interest rate fluctuations. But they really don't have a very deep understanding as to why interest rates rise or fall over time. The interest rate works in the supply and demand market for loanable funds, just as regular prices do. Here, the interest rate is essentially the price of accessing money. It's the price of loanable funds. And if you know how to use a supply and demand diagram, then you can determine what causes interest rates to rise and fall. Interest rates are the price of loanable funds quoted as a percentage of the original loan amount, and it's determined by supply and demand. It can be viewed as on both sides of it. If you're the person supplying the funds, what you get in return, the price of supplying your good, but here it's loanable funds, the reward for savings is what you earn in interest. On the other hand, if you're someone who's seeking a loan to borrow money, this is the cost or the price of doing that borrowing, of accessing money that you didn't earn um, previously. So when we set up our model, we use our two-dimensional XY diagram for supply and demand. The X axis is the good that this market is focusing on. Here, it's money, it's loanable funds. And so we're gonna call this savings and investment and it's measured in billions of dollars. On the Y axis, we always measure price. And here, the price of loanable funds is the interest rate, quoted as a percentage of the original loan amount. Savings is the supply of loanable funds. When people put their money into a savings account, that money becomes available by the bank to be loaned out. So this is supplying money to the loanable funds market. Demand is investment. The demand for loanable funds are the people who are borrowing money, taking out loans in order to invest in new capital projects. So let's look at these and think about them in terms of what we already know about supply and demand. The savings curve is the supply of loanable funds. It's upward sloping or it has a positive slope, which means that the price and the quantity move in the same direction. This is positive because the amount of money available or supplied will increase as interest rates increase, right? If people can earn a higher rate of return on savings, they're more likely to put more money into a savings account. On the other hand, investment, which is the demand side of this market, has a negative slope. This tells us that prices and quantities move in opposite directions. This is because as the interest rate goes up, people will want to borrow less money because it costs them more to do so. And as interest rates go down, it costs them less to access that money, so they're more likely to take out a loan. So these two things move in opposite directions that the quantity of loanable funds demanded increases as interest rates decrease. Savings is channeled into investment in the loanable funds market. Loanable funds market. In this market, we want to remember that it's loanable funds that are the goods being bought and sold. The price of that good is the interest rate. And this price, just like any other market determined price, is determined by the interaction between supply and demand. Here, we can see that at the intersection of these two curves where supply and demand are equal, that is where savings equals investment, 
there's an interest rate that is determined by their intersection in equilibrium. Here, it's 4%. So from the saver's perspective, if you're the person, the household who's providing your money in the form of savings by saving it in a bank, then when you save your money, you're supplying funds to the loanable funds market. And the price that you receive in return is the interest rate. If you have a positive balance in either a savings or a checking account, you are technically a supplier in the loanable funds market. For savers, the interest rate is your reward. Every dollar that you save today returns more in the future as long as the interest rate is positive. The higher the interest rate, the greater the returns will be in the future and the more that you'll want to save. So for example, if an interest rate is 3% per year and you save $500 this year, then over the course of this year, you'll earn another $15 on that amount so your savings account will go up to $515 next year, and you didn't really have to do anything except keep that money in the bank. Therefore, the loanable funds supply actually follows the law of supply, that prices and quantities move in the same direction. The quantity of savings will rise as the interest rate increases. This table represents the future value of a savings in the amount of $500 at different interest rates. So for example, if you save $500 for one year at 4%, you'll at the end of that year have $520 in your savings account. And you can follow this table. If you were to save at 6% per year, you would have $530 in your account at the end of the year. The higher the interest rate, the greater the incentive to save. If you can find a bank that pays you 10% interest, which is really high, you could potentially have $550 after just one year of savings. Higher interest rates induce more savings as people respond to these incentives. This is the loanable funds version of the law of supply. Quantity of savings rises as interest rates go up. So let's practice what we know. Where does the supply of funds in the loanable funds market come from? It comes from consumers who put their money into checking and savings accounts at their bank. The interest rate can be thought of as D, the price of money. It's what we earn when we are supplying money to the market, and it's what we pay when we're borrowing money from the market. So now, on the other hand, let's look at the demand side. These are firms and foreign entities, sometimes governments, who are looking to borrow or make loans from the savings available. So from the borrower's perspective, an interest rate is the cost of borrowing that money. Firms should only borrow if they expect a greater return on their investment, ROI, than what the loan costs. So for example, if there's an interest rate of 6%, a firm would only borrow the money if they expect to make more than 6% in returns from the use of those funds. If we apply that rule, as the interest rate falls, the quantity of loans demanded will rise. This yields the inverse relationship between interest rates and quantity demanded for loans that's embedded in the downward slope of the demand curve for loanable funds. Profit maximizing firms borrow to fund an investment and if that investment is expected, to is, is the, is expected to return more than the interest rate, then it's beneficial for them to borrow that money now and pay it back later. Just like we saw in previous chapters, we had nominal GDP and then real GDP corrected for inflation. We had nominal inflation, I mean, we had nominal interest rates and now we have real interest rates corrected for inflation. Savers and borrowers should care about the real rate of interest on a loan. This is the rate that describes how the real purchasing power of their funds is going to change over the course of the loan. The nominal interest rate is, is the interest rate that you're quoted at the time that you take out the loan or at the time that you provide the savings. However, the real interest rate is going to affect how you're able to use that money. So since interest rates are, result, are the result of supply and demand in the market for loanable funds, higher inflation rates 
lead to higher nominal interest rates in order to compensate the lenders for their loss of purchasing power. The difference between the real and nominal interest rate is the rate of inflation. This is what the Fisher equation tells us. It says that the real interest rate, rate equals the nominal interest rate minus the inflation rate. So here's a graph that shows the nominal interest rates and the real interest rates over time. And you can see that nominal interest rates are higher than usual when inflation is also high. Because when inflation is high, that means each dollar loses some value. And so people have to be compensated for the fact that they're going to be, earn, um, they're going to be given back money of less value. And so therefore, they're going to charge higher interest rates to people to account for the fact that money is losing value over time. If inflation is positive, nominal interest rates will always be greater than real interest rates based on the Fisher equation. On the other hand, if inflation is negative or deflation, then the real interest rate will be greater than the nominal interest rate, again, simply based on the Fisher equation. The difference between the real and the nominal interest rate is always the rate of inflation. The experience that we see here that happened in the 1970s illustrates that nominal interest rates are historically higher when interest when inflation is also high to compensate people for the for the loss in purchasing power. So that's the basic supply and demand model for loanable funds, and it describes how the interest rate is the price in that model. In part two of this video, we'll go into different factors that can shift the supply and demand curves in this market and examine what happens in equilibrium as a result. So hang on tight for the next video and I'll see you then.